Okay, very good morning. Hope you are doing well. It's Wednesday, the 13th of October, and I'm going to talk you through a few different things. We're looking at Apple's aftermarket decline in share price that we saw last night, and I'll explain why that's happened, as it's reported that the company might well slash its iPhone 13 production um, targets. We're also going to talk about Chinese trade data, a couple of Fed uh, comments as well to be aware of, one of which uh, Bostick said that transitory is a dirty word. And in fact, when he was giving his speech last night, he was dropping dollar bill every time into a naughty jar. He said the word transitory. Um, we'll also talk about the formalities around the US debt ceiling. And then, of course, the day ahead. And actually, just before I get stuck into Apple, looking at the general um, set up of the charts at the moment this morning. So just to remind anyone who's who's new to joining us, I've got Euro dollar top left, cable top center, gold futures top right, and then I've got the center left to right DAX future, NASDAQ 100 S&P futures, and then I've got WTI crude down here on the bottom with bottom right, the US 10 year. And so overall, pretty flat this morning, in fact, there's not too much uh, movement seen. Their dollar index is is pretty much unchanged and therefore just marginal gains seen in the major pairs to get the European session underway. Um, as far as the equity markets are concerned, pretty similar setup for the Nasdaq as it is in the S&P where yesterday's lower bound levels that were seen around this time um, on Tuesday morning session um, are still holding for the time being. So certainly key areas to watch as support now really on three more meaningful tests that we've had in the last 24 hours around 43 21 and a half in the s p and as i said the nasdaq is is pretty similar here uh, in its formation for the time being on a daily chart on the downside we're still a little bit away from what would be seen as more longer term crucial levels of support with generally that rising channel that we have with the horizontal area of support coming in around 14 471 um, as you can see here we're trading well above that at the moment by around 200 points or so uh, and markets at the moment as you can see here just moving up the nasdaq future to its pivot level under no real new fresh catalyst this morning but perhaps people just looking to just uh, enter again lower down on those technical areas of support otherwise gold uh, not too interesting right now, but positive around five bucks. Um, oil's pretty much just locked in a bit of a sideways period of consolidation for the time being after some of the recent surge in price that we've had. So it's pretty flat overall, but holding an $80 handle. Uh, and T-notes just tracking sideways for the moment, basically trading unchanged. So let's jump straight into it and talk about Apple first and why did their share price decline around 1.3% after market? Well, the headline is here. The company is likely to slash its projected iPhone 13 production targets for this year by as many as 10 million units. And the rationale behind this is because of a prolonged chip shortage hitting then its flagship product. Again, I must stress this is according to people familiar and have knowledge of the matter rather than an explicit comment from the company itself. But you can pretty much take it that it is uh, the way that these news cycles tend to work. And so Apple shares, yeah, they did fall after market and certainly something we'll be keeping an eye on. I guess for a bit of context, here's a look at, you know, given the impact that the global um, chip, light, chip supply shortage is having on a number of manufacturing processes, that this is looking at the gap between ordering a chip and a delivery of it hitting uh, are now a record of 21.7 weeks. So as you can see here in pre-pandemic times, the average kind of, time from order to delivery would have been in terms of weeks uh, roughly about half of what it is at the moment currently so uh, definitely puts that into a bit of perspective but in this article um, it was on bloomberg if you want to have a, a more of a read i did retweet it from the amplify me twitter account um, it does go on to talk about the fact that, that it's still likely that Apple's going to have an absolutely phenomenal quarter going into that christmas season when we get to q4 um, given the fact that the refresh rate for the iPhone 13 is, is like to be quite strong. And I think we're looking at um, predicted revenues for that quarter alone when that time comes of around 120 billion in a quarter, which is just phenomenal um, in that respect. So um, some slags now. Um, I don't think ultimately this is a, a real deal breaker. Some people talking about a little bit of weight in the Nasdaq future overnight, but 
can't really say I see it that evident on my charts to be to be quite honest and the market at the moment's moving higher for the time being otherwise the other thing from overnight um, in the Asia pack session is Evergrande assigned it's still generating a few headlines but I think important is that yes they are missing some of these bond payments still uh, and it is still a bit up in the air about what is the next step for them as a company but I would say overall broader markets in the the assets that I've just shown you on my charts I think generally have just kind of accepted the reality of what Evergrande is at the moment and I think that that kind of period of heightened sensitivity to that whole contagion effect has definitely diminished a great deal uh, and so as much as their headlines and I continue to monitor them remain vigilant I don't really see that really shaping much of the intraday short-term sentiment or strategy for the time being on the flip side though from an economic point of view we did have overnight um, China's export growth accelerated in September and that has defied quite a lot of expectations of a slowdown um, amid a nationwide power crunch that has forced factories to cut production. So by numbers, the Chinese trade balance came in at 66.76 billion. Uh, this would be US dollars in September. That was above the expected 46.8 billion. Their export number year on year for September was at 28.1%, above the expected 21%, uh, and up on the previous 25.6%. Um, couple of things though um, and this was a comment from the spokesman of the customs department in China who said that fourth quarter trade growth may slow because of higher base of comparison from a year ago plus logistical problems uh, in addition global appetite for Chinese goods analysts say could also start to kind of wane after buyers front loaded their Christmas orders because everyone's it's kind of the chicken or the egg at the moment people are aware that there's going to be uh, production distribution issues most likely going into the Christmas period uh, given the, the kind of bottlenecks that we've been experiencing and that is that going to change consumer behavior and therefore companies forward front loading very early their Christmas orders which means then we get quite a dramatic drop off as we go into the latter part of this year uh, perhaps so yeah I mean how important is this Chinese data I mean it's interesting but if it is good i don't think it's necessarily a positive trigger to initiate any type of long-lasting sentiment i think it is what it is uh, on the surface level but as i said it's probably unlikely to remain at such a uh, good pace as what we've seen with the last two trade data numbers coming out of china which have actually exceeded expectations i probably don't see that lasting for too long and i think the markets are aware of that for the factors i've just mentioned the other thing then is yeah, transitory is a dirty, dirty word. I, I can honestly say I can think of worse dirty words. But um, yeah, the three speakers that we've had, Bostic, who is a voting member of the Atlanta Fed, uh, voting member on the FOMC, said that inflation surge is lasting longer than expected. So it, it is not appropriate to refer to such a rise as transitory. I, I don't think that's surprising. I think that's just generally how the markets um, become to view that situation and hence the reason why yields have seen some of the biggest moves um, in recent um, recent months um, in, in the last couple of weeks. Bostic favoring tapering bonds sees liftoff in more than a year. So very explicit again to kind of define the timelines that tapering is not rate hikes. The two are kind of two different processes. The other speakers that we have had um, is... Well, here's a look at the not-so-transitory inflation figures. And certainly, obviously, we're looking at this today because we get US CPI, which I'll touch upon in a moment, coming out this afternoon, which is obviously a, a critical component for, for how sticky or not this inflationary pressure is at the moment. The other speakers that we've had was the Vice Chair, Richard Carida, who noted that conditions required to begin tapering the Fed's bond-buying program have all uh, but been met. And so, again, given the green light, as markets are very much expecting for that November uh, announcement of tapering. And then the last one is Bully Bullard, uh, who sits right at the most um, kind of hawkish end of the spectrum, said the, um, here bond purchases should be tapered quickly in case rate hikes are needed. Um, started talking about advocating trying to get finished with tapering process by the end of the first quarter of next year. And to give that context... As what we heard at the previous FOMC meeting, they were talking more around the summer of next year. So hence the reason why he sits much more on that aggressive, hawkish end of the spectrum. 
Not unusual to hear that comment from Bullard. So again, of the three, nothing really there too shocking, I would say, and hence the reason why there's been no reaction, despite the kind of hawkish sounding comments in the US dollar, which if anything is retesting actually as I speak. Um, some of the recent lows that um, the Dixie has been trading. So actually keeping an eye on the Dixie as I'm speaking now, it's just retesting the APAC low um, at the moment, down about two-tenths of 1% this morning um, in the Dixie. Um, and then a few other things to be aware of today. You've got um, corporate earnings. We kick off the big banks today. JP Morgan's coming out just ahead of 12 o'clock London time. Uh, you've got the likes of BlackRock as well, pre-market. And then that kicks us off with then Wells Fargo City MS on Thursday and Goldman's coming out on Friday. Quick look at JP, um, what can we expect? So um, focus on JPM's net interest margin. So key metric, of course, for the banking uh, industry, reflecting the difference between the interest banks earn on their assets and the interest they pay out to depositors and other creditors. Um, quick refresh though, in Q2, of 2021 results that, that came out in mid-July for, for JP Morgan. Their bank bolstered their profits by freeing up another 3 billion in pandemic loan loss reserves that it originally set aside for pandemic-related defaults. So again, it's kind of, how do you kind of pump the numbers and make them look fantastic? Well, yeah, if you're freeing up reserves to the tune of 3 billion, that certainly helps. And so that will start to, to obviously fade as those um, loan loss reserves have already been kind of shifted in that sense. Um, in recent months, JP Morgan's rebound has, has faced a couple of challenges, and I guess some of these are, are, are quite true of other bank stocks as well that we'll be looking out for later in this week, that the Delta variant of COVID-19, particularly over the summer, has slowed the rebound somewhat of the economy. Um, JP Morgan's costs have also risen, boosted by pay to attract junior employees. You'll remember course there was that kind of infamous Goldman report that came out and yeah rather than seeing any structural change in the hours that they work 100 hours uh, which of course is pretty insane just throw some more money at these kids and uh, and hopefully the problem goes away and so obviously your cost base going up in that respect as well um, analysts expect tepid year-over-year -year growth for earnings per share to so the EPS and revenue for the quarter and this would mark a significant slowdown in earnings growth compared to the previous three quarters. So again, there's probably a, a reoccurring theme that we'll see through this earnings period is that there's a bit of a realization about what the future now is going to, to look like. And so a bit of a deceleration from some of the astronomical growth that we were seeing going through this um, really strong uh, equity run that we've had through the post-pandemic initial period now we're kind of to see the, the 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 top and slight fatigue of that and so a bit of a recalibration back to a degree of sense of normality uh, from those much more bullish outlooks that we're seeing before is probably going to be the order of the day to some degree um, final point from a from a, a student perspective because i know there's a number of students i've been talking to that are interviewing the likes of jp and and, and other u.s banks one thing i would say is that you know jump on the earnings uh, the investor relation pages of these these banks after they come out and do take a look at those top level sheets to get a real just glossary of like what the major divisions how they're performing the, the different drivers of different divisions um, just just generally get a flavor of how beyond just then the surface level that bank is performing so when you go into these interview situations you're just that better equipped about knowing your target institution um, anyone who needs help with that, just drop me a comment. I can shoot you the, um, the, the, the full actual press releases that come out. Not a problem at all. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> just jumping to what's happening today. We've already had some UK data, to be quite honest. Pretty disinterested in that. I mean, GDP estimate for August month on month was 0.4 against 0.5. The three month on three month figure, 2.9 against 3%. Um, in terms of sterling reactions, not really so much sterling reaction, but I'd say dollar a little bit softer this morning. Euro dollar cable uh, kind of following a uniform approach. Cable just accentuating that move a little bit on the short term technical breach of the late APAC high um, that we've seen. So just a short run up here towards its R1, up about 30 pips this morning. But equally so, Euro dollar is up about 21, albeit that's being held for the time being by uh, the APAC high. So. Yeah, I'd say the UK data really not a big deal. 
uh, as far as really shaping any new thoughts about the UK economic recovery at this point. Um, otherwise, jumping further forward, you've got Eurozone industrial production at 10, but the real more interesting events are really happening this afternoon. You've got US CPI, of course, happening at 1.30, and that's probably going to generate the most interest. It's probably one of the main highlights of the week, and certainly, I think, much more interesting, perhaps, than what we'll get out of the FMC minutes, which are coming out at 7 p.m. later on this evening. That's going to be scanned for clues, of course, any hints um, towards the, the formalization of the announcement of tapering in November meeting, but I think that's no surprise if that is the case. So I don't think we're going to get too much more out of those minutes. So for CPI, um, analysts at the Dutch Bank ING write that the reopening spike in key areas that we've uh, seen the rate of price increases moderate, but it's still faster than we, what we saw pre-pandemic with higher food and housing costs particularly evident. Um, they suggest then that this will keep the year-on-year -year inflation rates elevated with the risk being that they rise further in coming months given supply chain issues and infantry shortages as we go into the key holiday season. Hence the reason why, as well, you're getting these central bankers talking about, well, look, we shouldn't really be using this word transitory so, so clearly at the moment because perhaps that's not quite the case. Um, I guess more importantly, how's the market going to take that figure and react? Well... I don't think whether it's a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker, that's really going to change the game for the Fed in November. So any type of um, price volatility we see intraday is probably going to be relatively short-lived, I'd say, in that respect. Um, could it move? I mean, certainly, sure. I mean, if we get a, a forecast-beating number, the headline's expected at 5.3. If it goes up to 5.5, and let's say the core reading as well comes in at the top of the range at 4.3%, yeah, you'd probably expect the immediate reaction to be dollar yield strength, gold under some pressure, perhaps equities have a little uh, bump on the downside. And if we break that technical areas of support that we were looking at in the lights of the NASDAQ and the S&P, you might get a little extended run on the downside. I don't think it would be dramatic, though, even under that uh, scenario, um, because I think at this point it doesn't really change the bigger picture. Uh, I, I think people are of that view that inflation is going to hang about a little longer if it comes out a little higher on this side, again, with always with the CPI report in the US, just having a look through the breakdown of the report, uh, what is causing these price pressures to determine or not whether how transitory they are. Um, and so, yeah, I'll, I'll tweet that table uh, and identify for you um, any of those things that stick out later on this afternoon. Um, and... Yeah, that's pretty much it. So otherwise, speakers, you've got um, ECB to cost speaking at 11.30, Bank of England Cunliffe, Fed's George this afternoon, 2.30, and then the evening, George at 9.30, um, speaking alongside um, Brainard as well. And then fixed income supply, Italy, Germany, and then $24 billion in a 30-year note auction as well coming out at 6 p.m. from the U.S. So that is it. Going to leave it there. I uh, hope that was useful. Any comments or questions at all, feel free to just, just drop those below. Otherwise, I will see you guys tomorrow. Thanks very much.